Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. I'm Chris the Chimanchu, and I'm not joined by Justin Burke because he is getting some well-deserved R&R, but I am joined by our producer and fantastic person all around, Dr. Edward <laughs> Cordy. Um, Hello. So, <laughs> how are things going, Edward? Not bad. Great episode tonight. All right. How's, uh, how's being a senior treating you? Ooh, uh, I will report back on that after I get some sleep. <laughs> All right. Well, tonight our guest is Dr. Hilary Seligman to discuss food insecurity. But first, let's remind you a little bit about our show. We are the pediatric medicine podcast. We interview leading experts in the field to bring you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. I like that. It's like the Ohio State University. (laughs) The (laughs) Cashback Memorial. We have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Hilary Seligman. Hilary Seligman is a professor of medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics at the University of California, San Francisco. She directs the Food Policy, Health, and Hunger Research Program at UCSF's Center for Vulnerable Populations and the CDC's Nutrition and Obesity Policy Research and Evaluation Network. Her work focuses on food insecurity and its health implications across the life course. In addition, Dr. Seligman directs UCSF's National Clinician Scholars Program, which aims to train the next generation of health and healthcare agents prepared to work in diverse settings to achieve our goals of a healthier and more equitable world. It was a great discussion. She taught us about who suffers from food insecurity, some of the long-term consequences, and what we can actually do about it. I really think our listeners will really enjoy the conversation and it'll leave them craving for more. Oh, yeah, it's going to nourish some phenomenal discussion. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we miss you, Justin. Come back. (laughs) Welcome back to the Cribsiders. I have Dr. Hilary Seligman. Thanks for coming on the show. But first, we're sure because we're an informal group, I just want to say, can I call you by your first name? Please do. I would love that. Excellent. Excellent. So we like to start off just trying to get to know our guests a little better. Um, so I guess, could you give us a little little snippet of you know who you are and, and maybe something about yourself outside of medicine? Sure. I am trained as a general internist, actually, but I count myself primarily as a food insecurity researcher and a supporter of policies that support food security in the United States. I also happen to be a mother of three daughters and two Bernese mountain dogs. How's that? Wow. Three daughters and and two dogs. I I have four boys and I don't know if I could handle anything more than that. So. Wow. Four (laughs) boys is a handful. (laughs) Edward, you got any questions? Uh, Sure. Yes. My favorite question, Hillary, is... um, especially for people who I consider successful or that I look up to is um, what is a life hack that you've found? What's something that you do that's a little bit different than maybe other people? Yeah, I think that's a hard one. But since we're talking about food today, I'm going to say that my life hack is making my children learn how to cook and how to enjoy cooking because I often now finish work and go down to the kitchen and there's a hot, delicious meal waiting for me. And I don't cook myself. So this is incredibly appreciated. And I think will sort of be the theme of today uh, is how to better support eating habits among children and, and households with kids overall. Awesome. Awesome. That's, Chris, a, that's a great you one. Could, <laughs> that, maybe you guys could incorporate that into your house, Chris. Maybe. My oldest is nine. So... But soon, I'm sure he will. We will let him touch the stove. Actually, the, the seven year old loves to cook in the microwave. I mean, he loves the fact that he can take something out, he can pop in the microwave, and hit the couple buttons. He, he's just so proud of himself every time he can cook himself like a hot dog or something. So, yep, now's the time to start for sure. That's how they get healthy <laughs> eating habits. Excellent, excellent. Let's see, my my favorite question. 
stems from just sort of you as us as learners and sort of in terms of career and faculty development or just being a learner. What is your favorite failure and what did you learn from it? Oh, I came out of the field on that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I feel like I have all the time in the world to think because you guys are going to edit. So, <laughs> you know, I don't think in retrospect about failures. I have had so many things that in the moment I thought of as failures, but I look back and think of all of the things that I was able to learn from them. But I have had a lot of them. And I will say that the ones that stand out to me are the very difficult relationships that you have to establish and sustain in order to do impactful work in communities, especially communities that have been historically disadvantaged, and how difficult it is to have those very uncomfortable conversations and then to get up and acknowledge where we've done wrong and have another conversation again that pushes the conversation forward. That is where I have learned the most because those are the conversations that I think turn into the most productive relationships and the most productive work. Excellent. That's a fantastic answer. Um, I don't know. Edward, do you have any other questions for Hillary before we go? Do you have any picks of the week, anyone? I have a pick of the week. I think for some reason, I feel like my life is going to be now pre Sedaris and post Sedaris because I recently discovered David Sedaris and not just his books, but his audio books. And um, I just listened to Me Talk Pretty one day, and uh, it's from several years ago, but I was laughing, loving it, highly recommend it. That's awesome. And it also means that you have yet to discover David Sedaris on This American Life, which is um, definitely a treat. Awesome. I'll have to put on that list. Um, I guess my, my pick of the week is also a book and also food related. Um, recently, um, J. Kenji Lopez Alt. I don't. He's a he's a great food writer and food scientist. He has he was um, part of Serious Eats for a long time. He was a writer for uh, Cooks Illustrated, and he's got a YouTube channel. But he's got a great book called The, the Walk, which is basically how to cook Asian foods. And it's just a fantastic walk through like what a walk is, how to use a walk. And then he uses that as the premise to go through all these chapters of just how to cook food. And it's just a fantastic book and lovely pictures that he he takes pictures of his, the, the food that he cooks on all sorts of pan Asian cuisine. So that, that is my pick. Awesome. Love it. Hillary, do you have any picks of the week? Anything that you would like our listeners to check out? The honest answer to that is I'm in the middle of writing a grant. It's application season. <laughs> and I have a dog that just had a leg amputated and another oh, no. one that's 12 weeks old. So no, I've done nothing else <laughs> except for those things. So oh. no, I'm not sure I can answer that question for this week. Okay. <laughs> Hillary's pick of the week is grant writing. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It was just like back when Matt 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 had a uh, on the curbsiders had his pick of the week was a jump rope. So that's uh, you know sometimes all just, time. it's just life. That's an you can cut all that out. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Edward, do you want to take us out? Take us off with our first case. Yes, it would be great. And we have a case from Cashac Children's Clinic. And the, the first patient of the day is Newt Rishan. He's a four-year-old boy from Detroit, Michigan. He's coming to Cashlack Midwest for his well-child exam. His mom has no concerns about Newt. But when you ask the two-question hunger vital sign screening, it's positive. Mom says that they often worry about having enough food, especially near the end of the month when their SNAP benefits run out. In addition, Newt's BMI is at the 25th percentile today but was at the 35th percentile one year ago. So that's kind of the case that we can use to dive into some of these questions, Hillary. And the first one, just to get everybody on the same page, is what is food insecurity? Yeah, this is a, this is a very interesting case. The USDA defines food security as access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life and food insecurity as the limited or uncertain access to adequate food. Now, in the United States, 
the way we understand food insecurity is it's really about financial access. It's that the household doesn't have enough income or other resources to afford the food that they need. Now, you know, I think the next question that we uh, wanted to follow up on that is how do you think when we talk about you're, you're talking about financial access, if you do have financial access, do we have to think about food quality versus food quantity in relation to food insecurity? Great question. The USDA actually recognizes two levels of food insecurity, low food security and very low food security. And households that have low food security in general have sufficient quantity of food, but their food budgets are low enough that in order to meet that food budget, they're going to have to sacrifice the quality of the food they eat because shelf-stable, energy-dense, nutritionally poor foods tend to cost less in the United States than more nutritionally rich foods. Very low food security, which is a more severe form of food security, the USDA understands as a situation where both the quantity and the quality of food has decreased because food budgets are even lower. And incidentally, there's this new term that I think might be important for our conversation today called nutrition security. And that is a term that is really trying to help us focus on food quality, that you have to have enough nutrition, not just enough calories to prevent and manage chronic disease. Great. Yeah. Thanks for laying that out so clearly. And, you know, I want to um, kind of get back to, you know, I want to get back to our patient, but um, since you're talking about these different levels um, just broadly, I'd like to jump ahead a little bit and just ask who is food insecure in the United States? What what are the populations that are most affected and you know, are there particular inequities that we need to know about, we need to be paying attention to? Yeah, overall, if you look across the U.S., about one in nine households report being food insecure. And that doesn't mean that there is an episode of food inadequacy right now. It means that there were some episodes of food inadequacy over the past year because households in the U.S. that are experiencing food insecurity tend to cycle in and out of food adequacy and inadequacy. And this may be because um, money runs out at the end of the month, like in the case we just heard. It may be because the kids get breakfast and lunch at school during the school year, but now it's the now it's the summertime, and so there's no more breakfast and lunch. Or it could be because you live in a cold climate and heating costs are really high in the winter time, and that takes away money from the food budget. So one in nine U.S. households, but there are great disparities, and the households that have the highest risk of food insecurity in the United States are households with children. Households headed by a single parent, particularly if that parent is a woman. Obviously, households with lower incomes. And then Black, Latino, Indigenous, and other non-white populations also have higher risks of food insecurity. So one question I have is, you said, I think, one in nine. That's a pretty large number that I think will surprise a lot of people who are not um, knowledgeable in the area. How is this sort of estimated? Like what, what type of data is this gathered? Is this from like Census Bureau? Is this self-reported from different places? Like what, wh where are we getting this from? Great question. In the December supplement to the current population survey that the U.S. Census Bureau distributes every year for decades, we have asked the same 18 items about access to food and we get our national estimates from that data set. Very reliable. Now, we don't get enough data to understand food insecurity in some high-risk populations. We can't get any information about food insecurity in indigenous populations because we don't ask enough people. We don't get any information about who, how food insecurity rates differ among Asian subgroups in the current population survey because we don't, again, ask enough people. So it gives us our national estimates, but it doesn't give us enough in information to really understand the details behind who is experiencing food insecurity in the United States. Great. That's super helpful. We have kind of this background idea of who's food insecure, how we even know that, and then bringing it back to, so now that's kind of population level, bringing it back into the clinic 
I mentioned uh, with Newt, we, you know, this pediatrician had used the hunger vital signs, two question screener. Should we be using that in clinic? Should we be screening for food insecurity? Um, and just broadly, how do you think about it? Well, if you give me the permission to do so, I'm going to say both, yes, we should be screening and no, we should not be screening. Let me give you the yes first. The yes, you should be screening is if you have workflows in place in your clinic so that if you have somebody who reports being food insecure, you can do something about it, then yes, you should be screening. The argument against screening is this. There are certain programs in the United States that some people, many people in the United States are eligible for just by virtue of being a citizen of the United States or by virtue of living in the United States. For example, SNAP and WIC. And many people would argue that whether you are food insecure or not, if you are eligible for these benefits and you are living in a household with a child, you should have access to these benefits because we know that when we raise the food budget of a low-income household, dietary intake improves. The healthfulness of the foods that are purchased goes up. And so if you don't have the capacity to administer the hunger vital sign, your clinical system may have the capacity administratively to look at who might be eligible for SNAP or WIC, for example. And if they're not on it, why not? Can we support that? Gotcha. So you're saying if you have workflows and you have the capability and to do something about screening, if you get positive, then you should do that. Otherwise, you should more you should cast more broadly and make sure that uh, that these programs are available to to everyone. Is that exactly I, okay. exactly? Gotcha. Now speaking of screening, and we you know Edward said this a couple of times. This hunger vital signs. I don't know if I'm completely knowledgeable on exactly what that is. It's it's two questions. What what are the yeah. two questions in that? The Hunger Vital Sign is a two-item clinical screening tool for food insecurity that actually is embedded in the social determinants module of many electronic health records. So you can memorize the two questions, or it's very likely if you dig deeply enough, they're in your electronic medical record. And the two questions are, within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to get more. And within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. If you answer yes to either question, we consider you food insecure. Now, those are the official vital sign, hunger vital sign questions. I always preface that with a little introduction, particularly in households with children. And that is because asking the questions can be interpreted as stigmatizing if we don't do it in a non-judgmental way. And because there is a myth, and I do believe that all myths are surrounding a kernel of truth, that children can be taken away from their families for neglect if the parents report that they can't provide adequate food for the family. And so I always preface my hunger vital sign with, I ask all of my patients about access to food. I want to make sure you know all the community resources available to you. Many of them are free of charge. And that way, the question is not about picking you out, identifying you as not being able to provide, but rather being supportive of what your needs are. I love that. I love that preface and making the families feel at ease when you're asking them because you've said it multiple times. You've described it as a household condition and they definitely need to to hear that. And quick, um, I feel very lucky that our clinic uh, does have some of these resources. I'm glad that you mentioned that. It's so important. A quick plug for dot phrases uh, that actually can just pull in whatever you, you, the answers you click uh, into your note. So just quick plug for that. Um, Sometimes if you type dot food or something, uh, it'll pull in whatever came in from the flow sheet. Um, Or macros from any generic EMR you may be using. Right. Believe it or not, there are some listeners, children or boomer parents, that don't have ExpressVPN installed in every single one of their devices. You wouldn't let your kids walk home from school without telling them not to go into any windowless vans offering candy. So why let them go online and be surrounded by targeted ads without using ExpressVPN? Why does every family need a VPN? Each device, whether a phone, computer, or tablet, has a unique IP address, which is like a really long, hard-to-remember phone number. 
It can reveal personal information about you, like where you live or how recently you looked up the bronchiolitis guidelines. It's super simple for a stranger online to find your IP address. And if you've ever clicked on a sketchy link, opened an email with a butt image, your IP address could have been exposed. So why use ExpressVPN? It's an app that hides your real IP address, replaces it with a dummy one, keeping you safe and private. So easy to use. Just download the ExpressVPN app on your phone or computer, tap one button, and you are protected. Here's the coolest part about ExpressVPN. They let you choose what country you want your IP address to look like it's coming from. That's super useful because then you can use services like Netflix and Disney Plus who will give you different shows based on what country you're in. What a great way to pretend to explore the globe. You can secure your family's online activity and unlock tons of new shows by visiting expressvpn.com slash cribsiders. Use the link. You can get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash cribsiders, expressvpn.com slash cribsiders to learn more. So, Hillary, um, I guess this is kind of an important next step is just why do we care about this uh, so much? And, you know, I think it would make a lot of sense on its own to be concerned about hunger. We've already, you've said the word hunger, hunger vital signs. But beyond that, is there also more health consequences that, that we're worried about? Yeah, we can dive right into the health consequences. Or we can start with dwelling on the fact that in the richest country in the world, we have this problem at all, and that we have chosen to create a social safety net system that allows people to go hungry. Just as one data point, if you ask adults to look back on their childhood, about 50% of adults will report that they were on food stamps at some point during their childhood or adolescence. And about 90% of Black people will report that they were on food stamps at some point in their childhood or adolescence. So experiencing food insecurity is common in the United States. It is not exceptional. And to me, that is the reason that we need to think about its importance and how we're going to reduce food insecurity over the coming years. And now you want me to get into the health consequences. And I'm happy, and I'm happy, of course, to do that too. So here's the thing. When we look for associations between food insecurity and almost any condition, we can find it. And that's because food insecurity causes poor health, but it's also because poor health causes food insecurity. Just for a minute, think about a healthy kid who gets pneumonia. If mom has to take a week off from work to take care of the sick kid, the household income may be 25% lower that week because mom took a week off. And that is a big risk factor for food insecurity because you can't get behind on the rent. So what do you do? You make sacrifices in something else. And for a number of reasons that we can get into, that is very often food. And so if we were to look, for example, for an association between pneumonia and food insecurity, we would find it. So the real question becomes, what health conditions do we think food insecurity is causing in children? And the things that we think food insecurity is really causing in children is frequent infections, nonspecific symptoms like um, headaches and abdominal pain, mental health symptoms, and poor overall health, which includes higher hospitalization rates. And I want to also throw in here, because I think it's really, really important for long-term health, that food insecurity has a very important impact on educational outcomes. And we know that long-term, poor educational outcomes are associated with poor health as well. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, I, um, I just am going back to some patient interactions I've had where, because you mentioned mental health consequences, and where I'm immediately worried about just the interaction I'm having with with children based on kind of uh, what they're describing, their food situation is at home. What are the kind of main mental health concerns that, that we think about? It could be children, adults, uh, family, you know, just family in general. Yeah, food insecurity is associated with depressive symptoms, with anxiety symptoms. And, you know, we think about it as one of these chronic stressors that increase 
all mental health symptoms and probably increase inflammation and activate behavioral pathways that result in poor long-term physical and mental health. And so really, I think we have to think of food insecurity as one of these really important stressors for children. As an example, when we ask parents living in low food secure or marginally food secure households, so so a little bit food insecure, but not much, about the experiences of the children and adolescents in the household, oftentimes the parents will report that the children are shielded from food insecurity. They, they can't tell that the house is food insecure because the parents do all kinds of things to make sure that that isn't communicated to the children. But when we talk to the kids, they know. They know and they do things to support their families and to support their parents and to support their siblings. And that is a burden on children and adolescents and it is stressful. And that is one reason why for long-term mental health, it's really important that we support these families with adequate access to food. Great. Hillary, you, you mentioned earlier, hopefully, if we're asking these questions, we are going to have processes in place to deliver the next step, to deliver interventions and care for uh, this household condition. Could you break down for us just the buckets of interventions and Um, a little bit about them. Yeah, sure. So from a clinical perspective, I think about three buckets of interventions. The first is federal nutrition assistance programs like SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program that used to be called the Food Stamps Program, or WIC. The second bucket is community-based organizations that provide support through, for example, food pantries, free dining rooms, otherwise known as soup kitchens. And then the third is on-site programs in the clinical setting. Your clinic hosts its own food pantry. Your clinic provides vouchers for fruits and vegetables, a produce prescription program. But honestly, as the, f- as the field has evolved, and this has been happening very quickly over the last 10 years, there's becoming more and more overlap across these three buckets. And so now as clinicians, we're talking more about the portfolio of interventions as food as medicine interventions, which you can define as the integration of a specific food and nutrition intervention in or in close collaboration with the healthcare system. And all of these models, referring people to federal nutrition assistance programs from the clinic, referring people to community-based support, bringing programming into the clinical system, All of these can be food as medicine interventions if they include that connection to the clinic. So, you know, there are obviously in every community, there may be a variety of different types of resources in terms of food pantries or especially in their clinic. Like my clinic, we have a clinic, we have a clinic garden in my MedPeds clinic. And it's an awesome thing that we actually, after we harvest, we literally just leave the produce in in the waiting room. It's fantastic. Um, but something that is probably more common is the, the federal, federally assisted ones that you've talked about, including SNAP and WIC. Are you able to go a little more detail about some of the, 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 the details on who qualifies for some of these programs and what exactly, what's their goal for each of these programs? Yeah. Yeah. So federal nutrition assistance programs are by far the most impactful interventions that we have available for food security in the U.S. Why is that? They reach an enormous number of people. They're available in every county in the United States. And once you're enrolled in them, as long as you continue to meet eligibility criteria, you can continue getting support. And so we should think of SNAP and WIC as the first line of defense for food security in the United States. And and as a matter of fact, SNAP is one of the two largest and most effective anti-poverty programs in the United States. So SNAP is available um, generally uh, to low-income adults, less than about 135% of the federal poverty line, but eligibility criteria vary a little bit state to state. And they are generally available to uh, anybody who is a documented citizen of the United States who meets those income criteria unless they are an able-bodied adult that does not have um, caregiving responsibilities and is not working. Okay. So we can definitely see some expansion potential just based on your, your definition there. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Snap is, again, very, very large, and it provides uh, a debit card that you can take to any SNAP-approved vendor and use to purchase any foods that, that you wish to purchase. There are some minor exceptions for non-food items like um, toiletries, diapers, um, and uh, alcohol, um, and a few exceptions around hot food. But in general, you can purchase whatever you want with your SNAP benefits. This stands in distinction to WIC. WIC is the second largest federal nutrition assistance program, and it provides um, benefits to pregnant and postpartum mothers and children up to the age of five. And WIC benefits, in, in distinction to SNAP benefits, first of all, you just have to be living in the United States to be eligible for them. And also, you can't use your WIC benefits for any foods. There are very specific healthy food items or food items that have been deemed healthy enough to be included in the WIC food package, and all of your benefits must be spent on those specific food items. Now, WIC has been in the news recently because of some of the formula issues, correct? That's right. And I think that draws attention to this larger issue that our food system more broadly, I think, has been really taken for granted in the United States as being very robust and very capable of withstanding stressors. And what we've seen with the COVID pandemic, with the war in Ukraine, with climate change, is that we are not perhaps as exceptional as we thought we were. And our food system does have really important vulnerabilities. And the food formula crisis, I think, is really um, evidence of the fact that we need to think more carefully about how to make our food system resilient. Great. And I've got one more question on interventions because I I know a lot of people who listen may have similar setups in their clinic. Maybe they have a pantry, but a lot kind of one thing that I'm taking from what you're saying is that sometimes it might be just as or more important to have a really comprehensive way to make sure every patient has SNAP and WIC, these huge anti-poverty food assistance programs. That's a big takeaway I'm having. But one question I have is for clinics with a lot of undocumented people or other people who might not qualify for some of these programs, should we feel confident that there's data, that there's strong evidence for, uh, for example, recommending to go to a food pantry uh, for their future health or for their um, for their family well being is or, or for example, should we feel I mean, I can imagine we would feel good giving somebody food, but is it actually going to be helping the patient as we intend? Yeah, great question. Well, let's start with the fundamental question. Can we be confident that sending somebody to SNAP or WIC is going to make a difference in their long-term health? And there, the answer is an unequivocal yes. There is very strong evidence that SNAP improves health outcomes, reduces healthcare expenditures, reduces medication non-adherence and is good for you. Same with WIC. There's very strong evidence that WIC improves dietary intake and birth outcomes and even immunization rates and child academic performance. So SNAP and WIC are good. Now you ask about the um, impact of food pantries and food banks. Well, truthfully, there isn't a lot of evidence among children, but we have to think about the first steps that lead towards improved health outcomes. And that is, can the intervention reduce food insecurity and can the intervention improve dietary intake? I think it is very clear that food pantries can reduce food insecurity. The question about dietary intake is a harder one. It's still being studied, but I will say the charitable food system has engaged an enormous amount of resources, both people power and money, in building the capacity to move healthier food through the system. The food In many, many places in the United States, a food pantry of 2022 looks absolutely nothing like a food pantry of 2004 or 1998. They are very often now looking like grocery stores, distributing a lot of produce, having refrigerator and freezer items so that they are able to stock foods that are perishable. There's a lot of work to be done, um, but I think it's really important that 
until SNAP and WIC cover every child and adult in the United States that needs it, that we have these other systems that families can fall back on when they need it. And let me say, incidentally, something that may be really obvious, but it is incredibly hard to prove a prevention effort works among children. And at the end of the day, when we're talking about healthy diets, we're talking about a prevention effort. What would we need in order to prove that a pantry intervention worked for children? We would probably have to wait decades. We would probably have to enroll like thousands or tens of thousands of children to prove that the pantry reduced, for example, diabetes rates. So I really think that we need to hold as our outcome of interest, what are we trying to achieve with a pantry, improving food security and increasing healthy food intake? Because if we are waiting for the evidence to show that we can have an impact on long-term health outcomes, we will be waiting too long. We will be bypassing an entire generation of children, and, and that's not right. So stepping back away from just being a doctor, a pediatrician, a primary care provider, and being more of a parent, being a citizen of the U.S. and of the world, and want to do the best I can, what are, do you have any recommendations how we can support these different areas? Like, is it anything counts? Like, if you can donate to the pantry, fantastic. If you can volunteer your time, fantastic. Or um, are there ways to vet better pantries better than others? Are there large databases that can say, hey, this is a good pantry, this is another you know, I, I do remember like at the beginning of COVID, these food pantries were hit hard in a lot of different ways. First, people were out of work and couldn't work. Then a lot of food pantry volunteers are some of the more elderly retired people who there were also then more susceptible. And I heard there was a lot of, you know, shortages of volunteers helping at these places. So, you know, as for me to be as a, to become a better citizen, what what would you suggest are the better ways which we can and help? And then maybe if I have patients or parents who are asking me how they can help, I can then give them the same sort of suggestions. Well, I don't know if you're going to like this answer, but for the charitable food system, the answer to your question is give money, not food. And the reason why we should be giving money, not food, is because it is much more efficient for your state or local food bank to purchase that food in bulk and distribute it than for you to be buying the same thing in the grocery store and then redistributing it. So time is really helpful. These organizations run on volunteer time, but money is really what's buying that healthy food. And remember, organizations are subject to the same food pressures as individual households are. The healthier food costs more. So if your food bank is going to purchase brown rice instead of white rice, they have to have additional money. And the same goes for for whole grains and for fruits, distributing fruits and vegetables instead of, you know, fruit leather. It takes more money to do that. And I want to say at the end of the day, where can we be best spending our time and energy? It is by advocating in our communities for federal nutrition policies that better support children's dietary intake, and also for those upstream factors that result in food insecurity, and particularly those upstream factors that are disproportionately impacting um, Black, Brown, and Indigenous households. These are the drivers of food insecurity, poor poor employment opportunities, lower educational standards, mass incarceration. These are the things that are creating food insecurity. And so the more we can get pediatricians in particular, because their voice is very well um, understood to be really important in policy circles, the more we can get pediatricians talking about the importance of federal nutrition assistance programs and these other drives or drivers of food insecurity, the better off we'll be. Wonderful. Should we move on to the next uh, next case, Chris? I, I think we need to move on, but I do have one more. Uh, I don't know if there's an actual question in there, but um, I think I feel another area of nutrition that many of my patients have is school lunches. But I also feel that school lunches, for some reason, has a bad rap, and there is a lot of discussion about that. Do you have any words to say about that? Definitely. School lunches have to meet federal nutrition standards. And 
because of those federal nutrition standards, which are relatively high, used to be higher, but are relatively high, the average school lunch that is served by the cafeteria is actually healthier than a lunch packed from home. So school meals are good for kids. And there's some pretty good evidence that consumption, regular consumption of lunches provided at schools can contribute to improved health outcomes. Now, they do get a bad rap on palatability. And people will say, (laughs) well, if we make the nutrition standards too high, all that food's just going to go in the trash. And there are some studies that suggest that that is true right after a policy change takes effect, that when the food changes to healthier foods, waste goes up. And that's a problem from a food system perspective. But there's also good evidence that that's temporary. And kids accommodate to healthy school meals in the same way they accommodate to lots of other things because kids are resilient. I will also say that kids are subject to marketing pressures the same way adults are. And if the food doesn't look good, doesn't have a cool name, doesn't, you know, um, isn't plated in an attractive way, it looks gross and the kids don't necessarily eat it. But there are some low cost things that you can do, giving foods a cool name, making sure that the cafeteria looks appealing. uh, And those kinds of things are increasingly being studied as ways to increase kids' take up of healthier school meals. I'm picturing cool kale. Cool spelled with a K. Chris? Exactly. (laughs) I love it. I love it. See where I'm going with that? Cool, cool kale chips. I mean, we love our, our kids love actually kale, kale chips. chips so. Are really good. They're really good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we can move on. I think. <laughs> okay. Well, we're kind of moving towards that adult age group. So this is uh, our next patient who who comes into clinic. It's Nora Schmidt, and she's 16. So she has a history of obesity and prediabetes, and she's actually presenting to clinic with dysuria. And while you're going through your, your full HPI on social history, you find out that, that she's had multiple recent sexual partners and says occasional barrier protection and physical exam reveals a BMI of 33 acanthosis nigricans and then uh, that A1C is at 5.8. And so, we kind of can see a lot of potential future risks for this patient. And and I'd love to ask you, what are, I guess, starting just kind of on one of the issues that she's facing in her health, she's facing uh, obesity. um, What are some of the mechanisms, potential mechanisms that could make a patient be both food insecurity and have obesity? Yeah, we see this a lot in the United States. And it comes back to that concept of nutrition security and the fact that you can have plenty of calories in the United States for a very, very low amount of money, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting adequate nutrition. And it doesn't mean that you aren't stretching your food budget and worrying about where you're going to get access to food. And, um, and, and that's essentially where we get this term of the obesity hunger paradox that many, if not most people in the United States who are living in households experiencing food insecurity are overweight or obese. Do we see similar rates, whether we're talking about men versus women, children versus adults? So these relationships, yeah, these relationships are really complicated. It used to be that we could reliably find higher rates of obesity among women living in low food secure households. And that was because at that stage, and we talked about this at the beginning, people were getting adequate amount, adequate quantity of food, but they weren't getting an adequate quality of food. And when you're consuming really energy dense foods, it's really easy to overshoot your caloric needs, even if you're not getting good nutrition. But the truth of the matter is, as the entire country has become heavier the rest of the population has caught up and it's much more difficult nowadays to find those relationships. And it's, and it is, um, it is 
inconsistent whether men and children have higher rates of obesity if they're living in food insecure households. That being said, we do know for sure that children living in food insecure households have less healthy dietary intake and particularly lower intake of fruits and vegetables and certain micronutrients. And those are really important for long-term health and development. One of the things that we worry about among children is that if children are born small and underweight, they may be accumulating weight more rapidly, but it may not show up as overweight or obesity until after adolescence um, in, in young adulthood. And so, you know, potentially that's driving some relationships between food insecurity and obesity later on in life. A very active area of exploration and very um, difficult to understand. Yeah, it's so many complex relationships between these topics. And, you know, for this patient in particular who who we have in, in front of us today, for this patient in particular that we have in, in front of us today, this 16-year-old, what kind of issues should we have in our mind related to food insecurity and adolescence? Like in this very particular age group, you know, maybe 13 to 18, like what issues do, does this age group face uh, related to food insecurity? Yeah. So one of the things we alluded to earlier is that the fact that adolescents in particular feel the stress of um, food insecurity for their parents and are often doing whatever they can to try to help their parents. In some cases, that is things like, I'm going to eat less than I really want to, to make sure that there's food left over for my parents who who wait until I finish eating. This would be typical in many food insecure households that the children eat first, they eat everything that they want, and only afterwards do the parents eat. So adolescents may eat less than they otherwise would because they want to make sure food is left over for their parents. Or they may look for invitations to go over to friends' houses to eat so that there's more left in the home. And then unfortunately, um, we know that many adolescents have to resort to very unhealthy strategies to ensure access to food. And typically for adolescent boys, this may be shoplifting. This may be their initial entry into the criminal justice system. For girls, um, it may be shoplifting, but the other um, thing that we see is adolescent girls having sexual relationships with older men because it allows them, the men take care of them in ways such as providing access to food. Yeah, and it's not hard to see the, the quick downstream effect of, of those strategies Exactly. And the case that you gave us, yeah, the case that you gave us of Nora coming in with dysuria, I think that is a prime example of a case in which a child needs to be screened for food insecurity. And a provider who is not attuned to the risks associated with food insecurity, that may never cross that provider's mind. But it's particularly important in the situation of this adolescent girl. Not only because we should uncover the root cause, but also because in an ideal situation, the answer to that child's dysuria is not just the antibiotic. The answer is antibiotic and a way to support the household with food. Because if you just give the antibiotic, what's likely to happen, the same thing will happen again because we haven't treated the root cause. So true. So true, and I feel like we've we've covered you know so much top so much uh, information about food insecurity. We've gone from diagnosis to epidemiology to treatment and prognosis. But one thing that has come up, or I'm sure will continue to come up, is occasionally a learner or a provider, often very well intentioned, will say something like, "You know, I already have enough to do with the." biological side of medicine, is it really necessary for me to be paying attention to this side also? How do you think about that? And how do you respond to that? So one of the mistakes that we make in thinking about the hunger vital sign is it that it is the provider who has to ask the questions. And in fact, I would urge you to think about the fact that the provider is the worst person to ask the questions. 
And this has even been informally studied, although I've not seen formal studies that show this, that disclosures of food insecurity rate are acceptable to providers, but the further away you get from the provider, the higher disclosures get. So disclosure rates are higher to nurses, even higher to nurses' assistants, and the highest with the front desk staff. And so what I urge providers to think about is we do not need to be the people screening. What we do need to do is be the people who are following up on a positive screen. Because I think it is really important that our patients understand that we, as your clinician, think that access to healthy food is so important that I'm going to take the time to talk to you about it today. That if I see that you need a prescription for your dysuria, I think it's important enough that I'm going to stop and write out that prescription. And If you need a prescription for healthy food, I think it's important enough that I'm going to stop and write out a prescription. Um, So, and then with this patient also, we said that she's got an A1C of 5.8. So, Hillary, what are some of the mechanisms that connect food insecurity with a chronic disease like diabetes? So, let's start by acknowledging that nobody wants the physical sensation of being hungry. And we are hardwired to do something about it if we don't have sufficient food. So we've talked about this. This may be shifting dietary intake away from healthier foods. It may be binging when food is available in anticipation of an episode of food shortage in the future. Or it may be eating the same unhealthy food over and over and over because you know it's going to make you feel feel full and you're not sure you're going to get a dinner, for example. It's important that we understand these behaviors as adaptive in the short term because they are fulfilling that important function of filling you up. But we also know that if these behaviors and these dietary patterns continue for years and years and years, which is the typical pattern of food insecurity in the United States, if they continue for years and years and years, they're not good for you. This is the way that people develop obesity and diabetes and other metabolic um, diet-sensitive chronic diseases. There are other mechanisms related to stress, but I think the primary thing we need to think about is people are doing what they have to do in the short term, but we have to intervene to keep these dietary patterns and behaviors from becoming ingrained and becoming long-term strategies because that's when we get people predisposed to obesity and diabetes. Well, yeah, and this this is an honest curiosity, not a setup question. I remember something about like insulin dependent diabetics having uh, patients with diabetes having hypoglycemia rates changing. That's about the extent to what I remember, and it, I know you were involved in that. Could you tell us about it? Thank you for for plugging this article that you can find in Health Affairs. Um, What we did was we looked at hospital admissions for hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, in the lowest income zip codes um, and compared them to higher income zip codes. But we looked at what day of the month those admissions for hypoglycemia were occurring. And what we found is that in the last week of the month, when food budgets are most likely to be exhausted, the rate of hospitalization for hypoglycemia goes up by 27%, only in low-income households. And, you know, there's lots of ways that we can think about understanding the health risks of food insecurity, but that is immediate, it's observable, and that shouldn't be happening in the United States. It shouldn't be happening anywhere. But it particularly shouldn't be happening in a place where we have so many calories and so much nutrition available if only we were willing to distribute it to everybody equitably. That's chilling to hear. I mean, and that's important. I'm glad you gave us those details also because just to have our antenna up, I mean, we we all, you know, care for patients who are who use insulin. I mean, that's so important for us to keep in mind. All right, Hillary, thank you so much for such a wonderful discussion. You know, as we wrap, as we're wrapping up today, I, I was wondering whether you could sort of distill some of your, your, the best take home points for our listeners, uh, the things that they should walk away from, from listening to our talk and just to remember and take with them. Yeah, I think the number one thing is snap and wick work. 
our federal nutrition assistance policies are really important for the health of kids in the United States. The Farm Bill is being negotiated right now, and SNAP and WIC are funded through the Farm Bill as are school lunches, and there are many policy decisions that are being talked about currently that are going to have a really substantial impact on food access for kids in the United States um, for, for the next you know four or five years. The other um, take-home point is maybe an optimistic one. I don't want to leave you with a pessimistic story. And the optimistic story is about what we saw during COVID. Despite national press showing lines three miles long at food food banks, and despite attention to food insecurity, the, the rates of food insecurity overall in the United States did not budge at all. There were the same in 2020 as they were in 2019, although some populations clearly had a much more difficult time. How could they possibly have been the same in 2020 as 2019 with all of the economic disruption going on? And the answer to that is policies work. We know how to fix this problem. Unemployment checks work. People who need food spend that money on food. Raising SNAP benefits works. It decreases food insecurity. Giving kids a debit card to take home that they can spend on lunch when they don't get lunch at school, it works. So we know how to fix this problem in the United States. We just have not yet gotten the political will to do it. I love that. You heard it, everybody. We pay for cardiac caths. We can pay for food for everybody and prevention. Do you have something in particular that you'd like to plug related to food insecurity? Well, I would like to let your listeners know that FRAC, the Food Research and Action Center, and the American Academy of Pediatrics did release a few years ago a toolkit for pediatricians to address food insecurity. And if you are interested in learning some very applied clinical pearls for addressing food insecurity, or even reviewing some of the points we've discussed today, that's a great place to start. Great. That'll be in the show notes, everybody. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for giving us your time this evening to talk about something you're obviously very passionate about and something that all of us as pediatricians, as primary care providers, as as citizens of the world need to understand. And um, hopefully our listeners will take away some some of these fantastic things and resources and um, hopefully improve, improve the nutrition and the health of all our patients. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. This was a fun conversation. This has been another episode of The Cribsiders. It's for the kids. Get show notes and sign up for our weekly Knowledge Food Formula Feeds newsletter on our website at www.thecribsiders.com. We're committed to providing you with high-value, practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at thecribsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our our producer for this episode, Dr. Edward Cordy, and to our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, as well as our showrunner, Dr. Sam Mazur. I'm Edward Cordy. And this has been Chris the Chimanchu. Thank you and good night. Bye. Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode.